The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Dean preaches uh, for us today. Um, I just want to say that uh, this is going to be a fairly meaty sermon this morning. I would encourage you to listen to meaty sermons and to to keep your concentration on what's being said because it is the Lord who speaks to us through his word. Um, A visitor came to visit us here in our church some time ago. And uh, Lee was leading the intercessions And he went up to Lee and gave him a bit of a lecture about speaking more clearly. Then the guy made a big mistake. He came over to me. And he said to me, you know, your sermons are far too long. I just said to him, how often do you watch television? He said, most days. I said, what, two, three hours? And he agreed. I said... So you're not prepared to give 25, 30 minutes to the future of your eternal soul. You can give two, three hours to watching rubbish, but not paying attention to God's word. He went away with a bit of a flea. I wasn't prepared to have someone coming in here, ripping our worship apart and telling us what to do. But the word of God is really important, folks. It is inspired It is living and active, and it speaks not to us just about history and about the past. God speaks to us now about his relationship with us. And come on, Dean, I'm going to pray for you. (coughs) Father, I do thank you for Dean. I thank you for the time that he spent in preparing this sermon today. I pray, Lord, that you will give us a seriousness about this, Lord, that you'll give us tender hearts, ready to be touched by your challenges, but also encouraged by your love and the words of love that you speak to us today. Lord, I ask that you'll be close to Dean, that you'll give him your peace deep within as he brings this word to us today. Help us, Lord, to receive it and to hear what exactly it is that you're saying to us today through this, Lord, and help us to act upon it. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon him now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Psalm 23 is one that we're pretty much all familiar with, and um, and we've heard it many, many times. As long as I've been a Christian, the description of Jesus as a good shepherd has fascinated me. And there's lots of references to shepherds in the Bible, both old and new. But it's, but it's in Jesus' parables and his self-identification as the good shepherd that has really drawn me to him, I suppose, and has fascinated me in, my goodness, 17 years as being a Christian. I just so long I've been in Luton. See, God had his hands on me just before I came here. I thought, right, come to Luton. I'm going to have you. <laughs> um, I think it's how, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, it may seem strange that I, I don't actually come from a farming background. This is really loud. How are you finding this at the moment? Okay, great. So there's a huge echo. Um, <laughs> probably, yeah. I mean, I come from Worcestershire, and there's no sheep farming in Worcestershire, as I'm aware. And, you know, mum and dad aren't farmers. So it's quite strange, this whole notion of Jesus the Good Shepherd, why it should kind of fascinate me. In October, I had the privilege of going over to Israel, and um, I stumbled on a book just before I went, and it's called The Good Shepherd by Kenneth E. Bailey. And this is just, well, it's just given me some reason to feast upon, and um, it's totally bowled me over. 
in a way, that's why I've sort of come back and said, Glyn, oh, can I preach on some of the... Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm hoping you'll get some sort of enthusiasm out of it and you'll, you'll capture some of it because I've just... It's just done great things to me. And um, actually, even going out on the flight, it brought tears to my eyes, which is a kind of a good thing. So you may want to have a look at this later on. It's a really good book. And as I'm talking about books, and it's got nothing to do with a sermon as such, um, this was a birthday present. Um, my birthday is literally just before Christmas, and mum and dad got me this. It's called The Sermon on the Mount. It looks a very big book, and it's by R.T. Kendall. Now, R.T. Kendall was um, the keynote speaker at New Wine last year, and I've only just started this, and it's just amazing. It's going for the Beatitudes at the moment, but it's broken up into 90 small chapters and um, I think it's very, very accessible. You could take one of these little chapters a day. And the Sermon on the Mount is an amazing, amazing, um, well, it's amazing scripture. So as we're talking about the new year, and if you want to have a, a little project, a little journey with God, I'd really strongly recommend that you get out and get this book. You can get it on Amazon. I'm sure you get it at the bookshop as well. But it's R.T. Kendall, The Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm just going for the Beatitudes at the moment. And, you know, it's a delight. It's a little bit, it's a bit of sharpness there, which, as you'd expect, I've got loads of things I need to repent over, and I need the Holy Spirit's help in uh, helping me to put this into practice. But if, you, if you're looking for something to start the year off, um, I'd really strong, strongly recommend this. It's an absolute delight. Um, have a look at it at the end, the service. So I'm planning, and I've had sort of permission to do four sermons over four or five months, all about the Good Shepherd. And I want to kind of look at it from the Old Testament and see how it, well, from Psalm 23, and how it changes through the Old Testament. So we'll have a little look at Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and then we see how Jesus picks it up, and, um, and ultimately says that he is the Good Shepherd. So we're looking at the Lord is my shepherd today. In future, we'll be looking at the God who comes personally to us as the good shepherd. So this is where Jesus really does pick it up and identifies himself. So actually, I am the good shepherd. And we look at how God says, you know, I'm going to send you a good shepherd, as he does in the, new, in the New Testament. And then Jesus picks it up. We'll be then looking at the significance of the one and the 99. And, and, and I can remember Martin preaching on this not that long ago, actually. So, honestly, it kind of brought, it, it did resonate with me. So, I'll be looking at that. And then, finally, the Good Shepherd amidst, uh, amid thieves and wolves. And um, I'm hoping as we go through this over the next couple of months, um, you'll kind of enjoy it and you'll find something to feast upon. Okay. If we had lived during the first four centuries AD, you and I would be very familiar with symbols and images of the Good Shepherd and fishes and vines. But slowly from the fourth century onwards, this image of the Good Shepherd has been replaced by images of the suffering Christ. And that's Jesus upon the cross. Yes, that image is very helpful in our view and our relationship with Jesus. But it may only communicate a, a part of whom the real Jesus is. And yes, that is a very, very important part in who Jesus is. And I don't want to diminish that image of the suffering Christ. But if we learn about Jesus as the good shepherd, we may appreciate a more fuller view of who Jesus is, just like the early Christians. So I just want to, I'm not kind of diminishing Jesus as the suffering Christ. That is absolutely really, really important but if we see Jesus as the good shepherd, I think we might see something slightly more. And that's why I want to do a number of talks on Jesus as the good shepherd. Okay, let's start. I'm not going to go through every single verse because I don't have enough time. Um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go through a couple of them. So let's start looking at Psalm 23, a psalm written by King David. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Before modern times, the moment a lone traveler and a shepherd left the shelter and protection of a village, they were on their own. They had surrendered themselves to the mercies of the wilderness 
and the desert. You might want to put that image up in a second. I want to refer to this in a second or two. The Lord, in my, the Lord is my shepherd, amongst other things, is a statement that I have no police protection. In those open, trackless spaces, the traveler and their companions are alone. There are wild animals, snakes, dust storms, water shortages, and bandits, which threaten the traveler. Now, I took that picture when I was in um, Israel, and it's called the Path of the Good Samaritan. And it's, got, it's, it's the path where Jesus actually took. In fact, if anyone come from Nazareth, and they would have traveled to Jerusalem, and in fact, Mary and Joseph went beyond that and traveled to uh, Bethlehem, which is further down the track. That is the kind of area and the, uh, the places that they would have had to go through. And it's quite bleak. It's very, it's full of, it's like a desert. And so when Jesus talks about the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we might remember that as a traveler, and what happens to him? What happens in the, the parable of the Good Shepherd, I mean, the um, Good Samaritan? Some bandits come along and um, they beat him up and they steal his belongings and is left for dead. Jesus is talking about that place. And it would have been a very common experience for many, many Israelites. They would have been vulnerable on their travels. Now, there's Archbishop Nurses of Labrom. It's interesting I'm going to refer to him. as a 12th century priest. And he wrote, I wandered in the midst of beasts, dogs, and bulls that surrounded me. Lions opened their mouths and wished to ravish me. I was terrified. And because of my fear, I made a treaty with my Savior. Therefore, do not be afraid, O my soul, for he is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Here we see the Lord as a shepherd, a source of security in the midst of many dangers. Now, we feel like we're a million miles away from that here in Luton, in the United Kingdom. And in our modern lives, with big governments and social security and insurance policies, and police protection, it is easy for us to seek and take for granted other sources for our own security and provision. But for much of world history, and there are many, many places in the world today just like this, there is no or little state provision or security. There is no one else who is going to come protect and provide for them. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus as the good shepherd was so important to the early church. A shepherd takes care of his sheep. And without hesitation, the sheep confidently follow the shepherd, knowing that with his help and with him in the lead, all will be well. You know, who is our source of protection and provision? Who do we go to? for our, our provision and protection. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's funny, I've got a colleague here, and you know, we teach business studies, and so I'm kind of, it's really interesting when I do this, because I'm very much knowing what comes out my mouth in the classroom. It is sometimes quite hard teaching business and economics. You've got kind of the Bible, and then you've got the, the, um, the syllabus, and there's always kind of tension, and this is, it's funny when I kind of do stuff like this. Western economic systems are all about creating and then satisfying as many perceived wants as possible. As you know, we've just gone through Christmas, and the telly has just been an absolute wash of these things. Advertising is saturating us with, I must have medications and gadgets to be healthy, entertained, happy, successful, and to live happily ever after. That's the promise that they sell. 
But what does Psalm 23 have to say about our real wants? We see a basic set of wants that the shepherd provides for his sheep. And they include food, drink, tranquility, rescue when lost, freedom from the fear of evil and death, a sense of being surrounded by the grace of the Lord, and a permanent dwelling place in the house of God. An ever-rising mounting of material possessions is not on that list. And the question I want you to think about, is that list of provisions enough for you? The sheep know that only with the shepherd's help can they secure the the above limited list of basic wants. You know, are we trusting the good shepherd to provide for our real needs and wants? Or are we seeking to supplement what the shepherd provides with what we read, but what we think we need? Okay, verse 2. He settles me down in in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. A dog can be trained to sit and lie down, but not a sheep. Now I'm going to mess this one up. It says, you can lead a sheep to water, but you cannot make him drink. Sheep only lie down when they have plenty to eat and have quenched their thirst and not threatened by wild animals. The bark of a dog will cause the sheep to scatter. He makes me lie down, sounds like force to us, but the Greek Old Testament uses the word settle down or rest. A good shepherd knows that the sheep need grass and water and and tranquility in order to lie down and digest their newly filled stomachs. A good shepherd leads me. He does not drive me. He doesn't force us to rest but he knows that we need it. And I hope we know that too. He leads me beside still waters. Remember, this this is a psalm by King David. And David is affirming that the Lord, his shepherd, provided all these for him, food, drink, water, freedom from the fear of evil and death, etc., Yet look at David's life, and many of you kind of know your Old Testament readings. King David's life was turbulent. It had murder and incest. It had betrayal, adultery, treachery, civil war, the killing of his son. David knew every single one of them, yet he found himself beside quiet waters, What an amazing thing to write, Psalm 23. He didn't have a peaceful life all the time. And yet, he was able to say and write, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He settles me down and leads me beside still waters. Each day, the shepherd leads the flock to where it can get rest. And rest and tranquility are a part of, of their daily life. I'm not convinced that it is part of everyone's life here at Christ Church. And I think most people in this country don't necessarily have that either. Where you rush around like mad things. Now you may think it's easier for bachelors and single people amongst us to find rest and time for a place Sorry, a place for rest and tranquility. And it might be easier. But note the shepherd leads a flock of sheep. He does not lead a single sheep. A good shepherd leads a flock of sheep to green pastures and alongside still waters. Is being led to a place of rest and tranquility part of your daily routine? Do you think you would personally benefit from a routine of rest and tranquility? Why not ask the good shepherd 
to help you find a time and a place each day. He and we know we need that. And I don't think we can continue without that. Verse 3. He brings me back. He causes me to repent. He leads me in paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. Now the King James Version says, He restores my soul. And actually, that sounds quite nice. And as I was going preparing for this, it's, it's, it's really interesting how some of that Old Testament King James Version, that there is a beauty and there's a rhyme that, go, um, that sort of sticks in your mind. And I think it is a beautiful translation. But it doesn't quite capture the mark. He restores my soul can sound a bit like I was depressed and the Lord, and the Lord restored my soul and help me to feel better about myself. But this loses what the passage is about. The literal translation is he brings me back and he causes me to repent. This is a better translation because it makes clear that the sheep is lost and the good shepherd is obliged to go after it and carry it back home. Now, once a, sh- a sheep knows that it is lost, it tries to hide under a bush or a rock, and it quivers and bleats. The shepherd must, lo- must locate it quickly, lest it be killed by wild animals. Once found, the traumatized sheep can't walk, but needs to be carried back to the flock or village. The Western translation has lost the image of the lost sheep, that is the heart of Psalm 23. And the Hebrew word, and I think it's pronounced shuv, it's S-H-U-V, or perhaps in the West Midlands it looks more like shove. Um, it means re- return, repent. I am caused to repent. And aided, the lost sheep cannot find its way back home. Its only hope is the good shepherd will come after me, the lost sheep, and hopefully find me, pick me up, and carry me back to safely, safety. This is a costly exercise, as we will see in future sermons for the shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness, is referring to the fact that I was lost while straying in paths of unrighteousness. So it does fit the idea of causes me to repent. He leads me in paths of righteousness. A paraphrase. I was attracted to a nice juicy piece of pasture just over there and I thought I might just go and take a look and see what it's like. It looks so juicy. I'd just take a bite. Well, before I knew it, I was left behind and I was on my own. I was lost. What are the juicy pieces of pasture that are catching your eye at the moment? It sounds a bit like Genesis 3, verse 6. I encourage you to read that later on. It's, you'll know exactly where I'm going with this. It sounds a bit like Genesis 3, verse 6. Have a read of it later and think about how many times that has happened to you. Why does the good shepherd come after us? He does so for his own name's sake. A good shepherd has a reputation to keep. A good shepherd does not lose his sheep because he is a good shepherd and he acts out of his own integrity. We can be and we will be saved. And sometimes we feel that that's, we don't always feel like that. But actually, the gospel is very clear. Uh, Jesus, the good shepherd, doesn't lose his sheep. And again, we'll look at in the future that we have a part to play. We are going to be sheep and we need to bleat so the shepherd hears us. And that's quite important. Actually, real sheep who are lost do bleat. They are calling out to the shepherd. Do we want to be found? I'll talk about that in the future. Are you lost? Do you feel lost at the moment? 
Are you tempted to stray from the good shepherd's care and protection? What juicy piece of pasture is attracting your eye at the moment? Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the valley of the shadow of death is a valley or path that winds between mountains where it's dark and there's big um, gorges. Travelers march silently and slowly in order to avoid being seen or heard by bandits. They fi- the fear of death is constantly in their mind. They tremble, they expect trouble or death at any time while they're passing through. This path cannot be avoided on their travels. Now, King David, when he wrote this psalm, did not say that this valley is where the trail ends, so get used to it. But he did say that it is a valley through which a sheep may need to pass. The journey does not end here. We are not trapped or lost in the middle of the dark valley Now, one of the biggest problems we may have is the fear that the dark valley itself can generate. Such fear can cripple the traveler long before the valley appears on the journey. The journey itself through the valley did not destroy joy as much as the fear generated by the anticipation of the dark valley. Actually, sometimes I can think... Yeah... It's, it is interesting how things we ex- we look at those the, the prospect of going through dark valleys, and that could be all sorts of things. I know from my own personal experience, the thought of it can kind of eat into you. It generates a fear or exa- anxiety. I mean, not even there yet. We're not even passing through. Our hope is in the Good Shepherd. For a good shepherd leads his sheep through the valley to the other side. I will fear no evil, affirms the psalm. At this point in the psalm, God appears on stage as the psalmist David addresses him directly. For you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. If I know that the Lord is my shepherd, I know that he will lead me through the darkest valley and I am delivered from my anticipatory anxiety. Our problem is that we are used to being our own shepherd and we have relied upon the government or our wealth and our insurance policies to provide our own security and protection. But often these don't give us the security we really need. There are times in our lives when the government and insurances simply won't be enough physically or emotionally. And sometimes we are aware of this and we start to feel anxiety about future troubles. What if I lost my job? What if I lost my spouse? What if my health deteriorates? Where am I going to turn in my own, for my own security then? And there are times in our lives, and there are people in this church who are currently experiencing this, where they feel like they have lost or we have lost, we are lost in the valley of shadow of death. And we're not sure that we will ever find our, find our way out again. Therefore, do not be afraid, O my soul, for he is my shepherd, and I shall not want. This is why the early church found the person of Jesus as the good shepherd so important. Yes, Jesus as the suffering Christ is extremely important to Christians. But Jesus as a good shepherd can provide something much more practical and reassuring in in our day-to-day lives. Now, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus is in the rescuing business. He's a good shepherd. 
He doesn't lose his sheep. Jesus doesn't promise that we will have a life free of troubles. In fact, the Bible pretty much promises that we will have troubles. They are to be expected. But God promises that he will be with us during those times. And this is quite a painful message, this bit. Often mourning or times of trial create an entry point in our hearts through which God might get our attention. When we are happy-go-lucky, carefree, and on top of the world, we often, we're often difficult to reach. God is, no like, God is no likely to get our attention when all is sweet and smooth for us. However, when God allows that which produces mourning, just maybe we fall to our knees and seek his face and we learn from him. That is how it works. And that is why mourning is a blessing Okay, I'm going to wrap the sermon up now. I'm not going to go for every single line because we've got, I don't know how long that's been. <laughs> I have done a list of questions for home groups. There's sort of three generic ones and then I've done a three which I want, as home group leaders you may want to decide which is appropriate for your group. But it is a time for you to perhaps pray and intercede for each other in your groups and invite in the good shepherd to minister to you. Okay, join um, the service um, the sermon to the end. Do you need a good shepherd in your life? Do you know Jesus as the good shepherd? Do you need help to be led to a place of green pastures and quiet waters? Are you being tempted? or attracted to other green pastures that threaten to lead you away from the Good Shepherd? Are you currently lost in a valley of the shadow of death? Are you anxious about a valley of darkness ahead of you? As we will see in the future, Jesus is the Good Shepherd, and he affirms that in the Gospels. What is amazing that is King David could write that. In fact, it's quite prophetic. David, who had quite a tr troubled life, had some really good times of blessings and peace and prosperity, but he had some, he was a, he was a human, he was a man, he was sinful. And he did all sorts of things which he shouldn't have done. But he knew the Lord was his shepherd. And when David, when we wander away, we can be found. The good shepherd will come after us. There will be a time of ministry at the end of the service. And I'd encourage you um, to come up and be willing, there'll be a number of us here who are willing to pray and to really just to invite Jesus, the good shepherd, to intercede and help us. I encourage you to read the notes and um, they'll be emailed to you. If you're not on the email list, you speak to um, Wendy, um, you'll get the notes and that happens pretty much each week. I know most of you get that. Have a think of the questions perhaps before home group and, um, yeah, and ask, ask the, the good shepherd to come and meet with you. Let's see if we can kind of experience being by still waters. Amen.